webinar with Jeff Cordell and Jason Tuft, researchers over at University of Washington. And um, this is Kate Boycourt, the New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary Program, and uh, our director, Bob Nyman. <laughs> and uh, we have a few others here joining us in, in the room here at EPA Region 2. And I guess I just wanted to start off by introducing this project. I think Jeff and Jason will give us a little, a lot more background. Um, but I, I want to tell you a little bit while we're interested. Um, here in our region, we have a lot of very urban shorelines. And in some areas, up to 86% are, are near vertical. Um, and on average, I think it's somewhere around, around 37 or 40% or are somewhat hardened shorelines. Um, and that doesn't give us a huge amount to work with in certain areas where there's a lot of um, real estate and, and other sort of socio-economic um, issues that, that would prevent us from doing much at the shoreline edge. And so I was excited to hear about Jeff and Jason's work and others in Seattle where they had a crumbling seawall and they had a salmon habitat issue. Of course, we're not as focused on salmon here, but there's a lot of relevant sort of overlap. And so um, we got in touch with, with Jeff and Jason a few weeks ago, and then they volunteered to um, do a webinar for us. So uh, without further ado, I, I introduce to you Jeff Cordell and, and Jason Toft. And they're, they're the principal researchers on this project over there in uh, Seattle. Um, and I just want to kind of review if I had some questions about speakers and talking and questions. So we'll ask you to please sort of save questions if, if you have them until after each presentation. And we're going to have two sort of short presentations that will stay within the hour. And we'll leave time for questions. And you can do that by typing it into your chat box at the bottom of your screen. Or if you have a microphone, uh, you can raise your hand. You see a little icon of a guy raising his hand. You can click on that, and I will enable your microphone audio. Um, it, it's not seeming too loud, so we might have trouble hearing you. Uh, so if worst comes to worst, just type your question into the, the chat function. And, and we're recording this, so if you want to see it again in the future, if there's something you missed, we'll put it on the website. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll leave it off to you guys, Jeff and Jason. Thanks, Kate. Thanks for inviting us to present this stuff. Uh, so I'm Jeff Cordell, and I'm here with my colleague, Jason Toft. Uh, our background here in our research group at the University of Washington's wetland ecosystem team is in um, a lot of it is in restoration ecology. And we've worked a lot over the last three decades in um, brackish water systems, including a lot of industrialized um, and a whole continuum of not industrialized areas. But in the last decade and a half or so, we, we've started working in these more marine, uh, central waterfront, highly urbanized environments. And what we are going to present to you today is um, a couple of projects that we've recently wrapped up that have to do with um, restoration ecology and habitat restoration along this central waterfront uh, area. Um, so just in the way of background, as Kate alluded to, um, salmon drive a lot of the ecology and restoration ecology in this, is in this region. I think most of you are probably aware of that. And that's definitely the case here in Elliott Bay, where the city of Seattle resides. This is the outlet of uh, a major river into um, Elliott Bay here, the Green Duwamish system. And there's four species of Pacific salmon that that, um, that use the estuary and that, uh, that are in the river. And they out-migrate after they hatch. Um, two of the species out migrate at a very small size, around 30 millimeters or so. And two of the other species are a little bit larger, but they all use the near shore to one degree or another. And so they're coming out of the river here and out migrating along this urban shoreline. And they're inevitably heading north out to the Strait of Juan de Fuca and the ocean, a lot of them, which is this direction here. And so they encounter this landscape of, of piers and pilings and highly urbanized structure. 
Um, so I'm going to be talking about some of the uh, efforts we've done first on trying to make a more fish-friendly, quote-unquote, habitat on vertical seawall, which is a, a major habitat feature in these urban shorelines. And then the second talk is going to be Jason talking about um, restoration along the urban shoreline um, in a non-vertical, more, more um, uh, beach restoration and uh, intertidal restoration. And that's this little tiny green spot right here at the north end of the, of the city. So we'll get to that in a little while. Um, over here on the right, you see the central waterfront, and that's the area that the, the seawall habitat, uh, vertical habitat enhancement study was done right here, central part of downtown Seattle. A little bit more background context. So the city built the seawall in the 1930s to create a deep water port. It used to be a, a sand beach or, and with uh, erosional bluffs here feeding them. You can see here early on, this is probably the early part of the 1900s, maybe even late 1800s, railroad going in and development starting. Uh, so this intertidal zone that the salmon are out migrate along uh, was transformed into a vertical wall over time, uh, resulting in few shallow areas remaining. Um, the, the life of the 1930s seawall was 45 years, I, I think. It's 45 or 50 years, and uh, it's well outlasted its um, design life, and it's now in, in bad disrepair. There have been a lot of problems with um, boring invertebrates eating the infrastructure behind the wall. So it's definitely, we had a big earthquake, um, oh, 15 or 20 years ago now, in the Squally earthquake, and the seawall moved around a lot, and it kind of put it right up front center on the radar screen for replacement. So the upshot is that a bond issue was passed last year, seawall replacement's going ahead, and construction will start on it uh, in uh, a year from now. Exactly a year from now, they're doing the preparatory work right now. So to get back to the, the driver here, the shoreline salmon, um, as I alluded to in the first slide, it's a migratory corridor and rearing habitat for these juvenile salmon. As I said, two species are quite small, pink and chum, and they really have an affinity for shoreline. And two other species, Chinook and Coho, uh, are a little bit larger when they outmigrate and have slightly less affinity for the really shallow water, but are still found close to shore using these nearshore habitats. Um, probably the biggest regulatory driver of all was in 1999 when um, Puget Sound Chinook were, were listed um, under the ESA. And that, of course, uh, clicked in a whole bunch of regulatory um, rulings and necessities for preserving that run of salmon. Um, Jason may or may not allude to this a little bit more in the future, but he conducted some research. Um, when was that, Jason? The mid-2000s? Uh, yeah, 2003, 2004. Um, which is really the first research that, that we've done, we did along the central waterfront, found that salmon did have this nearshore imperative. We're very close to shore. And what happened when you have seawalls that um, terminate the, the gra gradual shore, the gradual beach um, habitat, is that they all are forced up along the seawall into relatively deep water. We had a grad student who studied chum salmon, and I think he found the mean depth at which the juvenile outmigrating chum salmon were at was about 18 inches. So when they don't have that shallow water, they're right up against the seawall. So in addition to that, Jason also found that salmon diets, as they are throughout their range, were linked to these intertidal habitats. So um, that sort of put habitat restoration in the redevelopment of the seawall on Seattle waterfront front and center with regard to these juvenile fish use, juvenile salmonid use. And so the city began considering enhancement possibilities for the seawall. Uh, and this is a cartoon that the city had commissioned that sort of shows the various types of 
habitat restoration that have been and are being considered and put into place. Um, I put in red the textured wall here because that's the one I'm going to be talking about in this first half of the talk here. Um, but other things such as um, making riparian vegetation available, enhancing the substrate. Some people have proposed cobble reefs, but which aren't very popular with some of the fisheries folks, uh, but a variety of things. And, and Jason's talk on the Olympic Sculpture Park later is going to look at some of these other substrate enhancements, such as uh, intertidal benches here and beaches. But this one's about texture panels. So again, question was, when you have a vertical seawall and you can't do anything else with it, you can't create a beach, the real estate isn't available, um, what can you do on this vertical habitat? Uh, and early on, the concept of engineered microhabitats came up. But basically, the, the most basic concept is to um, supply complexity of habitat on a surface seawall that previously had almost no surface complexity. Uh, one of the basic tenets of ecolo intertidal ecology is the more complexity you have, the more species diversity and, and often abundances of organisms you have. So that's the basic premise. And so the city got us involved early, early on in the design process. Um, the city uh, provided a design and fabrication and installation of the panels. And then we were able to obtain um, uh, research grant funding through the UW from Sea Grant and a local King County King Conservation District uh, funding source to conduct biological monitoring of some of these experimental treatments that were put on to the wall. So Jason and I learned a lot more about concrete fabrication than we ever thought we would when we got into biology. Um, these panels were designed and built, as I said, by the city. They hired a contractor who fabricated these molds, poured them, and this is a picture here of a backhoe putting one of these panels onto the Seattle seawall. There's the little guy right down here with a big wrench, and they just basically bolted these one-ton panels onto the wall. And this is an array of the panels that, what it looked like just after uh, installation. I believe installation happened in uh, winter 2007 to 2008. Think. We monitored these things for four years. And so here's sort of the experimental design of these uh, habitat panels. So we had three sites. And <laughs> we had some trouble with this small n equals 3 number with statistics and one. And any of you who have worked with stats knows that n equals 3 is a, a very low number. It gives you one degree of freedom for statistical analysis. but this is virtually the only three spots on the seawall that we could get all of our experimental treatments in and that were available and, and yada, yada, yada. So we had these three spots that we put this array of panels in. And this was the basic sample design over here. We had um, three major reliefs. A no relief, which was a flat panel. It was textured with what they call, I think, a broom texture, where they basically broom the concrete before it sets. We gave it a little microstructure. But then we, we had uh, steps and what we called fins. And to be honest with you, we just sort of pulled these out of thin air and discussing some of the early concepts. Uh, nobody's done this before, really. So we wanted to add uh, complexity at this scale of relief. So we just came up with these designs. And within each of these three reliefs, we had uh, another level of complexity, which was these cobbles. These are just off-the-shelf form liners, so putting this texture in doesn't add much to the cost of uh, fabricating a, a seawall panel. So these things were put out in this configuration. Oh, I, I should say there was a referencing control. So the reference was just a piece of seawall that was left the size of one of these panels adjacent to, to, uh, to the panel um, placement. And the control was a power washed section of seawall that we had power washed, city power washed for us to sort of set the existing seawall back to zero. So that was our that was our sample design. 
And we measured two things, basically, two, two types of biota. Well, first was sessile organisms, so like algae, barnacles, um, mussels, organisms that were sessile and on the panels. And starting really soon after their placement, we were out there, we had a grad student, Maureen, and much of what I'm gonna present is, uh, is the result of Maureen's master's thesis work, so I wanna give her credit here. Um, so we measured sessile organisms using this, this quadrat, and it's simply just recording what's in each of these squares so you can yield a percent cover of these different kinds of sessile organisms. And we measure three elevations, and they're kind of represented by the three steps here. So an upper, a mid, <clears throat> and a lower elevation. And yes, I was right. It went, they went in the end of 2007, beginning of 08. And so we monitored them four years, 2008, 08 to 2011. So one of the first things we wanted to know was, um, was the community composition on these panels similar to that which was occurring on the seawall? So that we knew we were comparing apples and apples when we did our statistical tests and looked at various kinds of organisms to see if they were benefited by this panel habitats. And <clears throat> so we did this community composition, or I should say Maureen did this community composition um, evaluation. And the y-axis here is just, a, it's a measure of similarity, basically. Um, and so what we wanted, and this line here represents sort of an accepted uh, level of that similarity measure for uh, things being similar. So what we wanted, what we wanted was for the all the panels to sort of converge with the control and the uh, and the reference. And so, interestingly, it looked like the control. Yeah, sorry, it's compared to reference. So this line is the reference line. I think no, that's the similarity line. I'm sorry, I'm misleading you a little bit. Um, all of these are compared to the reference, right? So the interesting thing is that the control, which was the power wash section, had a little bit of a head start on the reference. So apparently there was still a few organisms left after um, after the power washing, and it was always ahead of all of these treatments until 2009 when everything converged. So the upshot is that everything pretty much converged into its similarity after the first year. So after the first year, we felt Yes, we can make these comparisons uh, for different organisms and among the panels. And I know we're comparing apples to apples. So one of the first things we look at usually is taxa richness. It's just simply how many taxa of organisms there are. And in all of these subsequent, with the exception of one slide, the finned and stepped, so the high relief panels, are going to be on the right side of this clusters per year. And the flat treatments, the reference, the control, and that flat treatment are on the left side. And what you see right away is the right side of the graph for these sessile organisms always seems to have higher tax of richness all the way through from fairly early on in the study through the end of the study in the end of 2011. And in fact, in, in many or most cases, these were statistically significantly higher tax of richness values. So, so that's good. So the next thing we looked at with these sessile organisms is a, is a few uh, important, uh, ecologically important taxa, uh, um, so-called uh, ecological engineers. Uh, and mussels are one, and they call the ecological engineers is because um, they, in their, they themselves provide habitat by creating all these little interstices that other organisms can inhabit. So <clears throat> they're regarded as being important species. And um, what Maureen found in her first two years of study was that by the end of the second year, um, indeed, again, on the right side of these clusters, there were more mussels on fins and steps than on the other treatments. But as important or more important, these cobble, the smaller scale of habitat, the cobble had higher, significantly higher 
numbers of muscles. In any case, then the smooth texture did. So what happened was the muscles recruiting to these panels were crawling up these, these crevices here that the cobbles made. Um, unfortunately for us scientists, we like it to be nice and clean and for things to carry through year after year after year. But in our, our years three and four sampling, some of that statistical uh, significance disappeared. But an interesting thing did happen was that in years three and four, muscles just exploded on these panels. So this red line here shows the maximum number of muscles we found um, in, in 2010, in 2009. That was uh, the first two years. And you can see that beginning in the spring of 2010, muscles started exploding. And in 2011, they, they were much higher in abundance um, on pretty much all the panels. And we kind of were a little bit flummoxed by this at first because, you know, we sort of had the expectation that these habitat features themselves were going to be, um, be driving the abundances and not just the fact that it was a panel. But then we kind of realized that these panels have a relief themselves. They're about six to eight inches deep bolted onto this seawall. And muscle predators, we think, may have a hard time getting onto those panels. You don't see very many starfish on these panels, and they're the main predator of the mussels on the panel. So just the panel factor itself appears to have an effect. We found interesting. Another one of these ecosystem engineers is the alga fucus, the rockweed. And in this middle elevation, Maureen again found that on steps and fins, rockweed was significantly higher in abundance in her quadrats than, than other species. Uh, this is the one graph that doesn't have that scenario of fins and steps on the right side of the graph. This is just the fins and steps are grouped as sloped and the vertical as the, the non-high relief panels. And you can see in our subsequent two years of study that there's a huge difference in fucus. Although Jason tells me this is not statistically significantly different, but um, it looks like a huge, a pretty big difference to me. A lot of the problems we have with stats, again, is that low replication. And um, probably, I, I think if I remember correctly, a lot of this is driven by just one of the sites. <clears throat> so the other main group of organisms we looked at are um, what we call epibenthic organisms that are associated with either these ecological engineering species like the algae and the mussels or, or detritus and other um, features of the bottom that, that encourage these organisms. Um, we sampled them with this pump. <clears throat> you can see me there on the, on the left side with a pump. It's just a, a bilge pump with this little apparatus on the bottom that encloses a given area of the bottom. <clears throat> and it sucks up these little organisms that just so happens uh, salmon feed on. And over the last three decades, we've documented the types of organisms that <clears throat> salmon feed on. And we know very well um, what the, spe the, the actual species of these little organisms are. So we're able to home in on those when we do these habitat restoration uh, uh, studies. And so again, from Maureen's thesis, um, you see these specific species of harpactacoid copepods that we know are important salmonid prey. And we go back to the scenario of steps and fins on the right side. And you see that, indeed, Maureen found that over the first two years um, that these specific species of harpactacoids were significantly higher on the steps and fins. So it's beginning to emerge that at least early on, steps and fins are better fish-friendly habitat than treatments without those high reliefs. And the same goes for these um, midge larvae, which are also both indicative of, of productivity because they feed on algae. You can see this one nestled in a nice nest of algae, but are also juvenile salmon prey. Um, again, unfortunately, some of these statistical differences broke down in years three and four when you combine all four years and you start getting a lot of variation. Things start uh, 
coming not statistically significant, but one thing we did find that was consistent throughout all four years of the study, again, was uh, tax of richness. And again, on the right side of both of these graphs for our, um, for our end of the study sampling period, which was spring and summer of 2011, higher tax of richnesses, um, uh, steps and fins. And that was fairly consistent and, and, uh, and statistically significant for, for many of the sample dates in the last two years. So I wanted to spend a minute talking about the lessons learned from this and a little bit, little bit broader, some of the issues that have come up with application of this habitat to the, to the actual seawall rebuild that's taking place. So, so the upshot is that the city has incorporated habitat panels into the vertical parts of the seawall in in, along the entire seawall, both including areas that can and cannot have more intertidal um, sloping habitat done. Um, one of the things, one of the construction issues that came up fairly late in the game with the seawall was that the seawall is going to be moved back. And so existing seawall is right about here right now. There's about a five foot overhang cantilever of the, of the um, sidewalk right now. What they're going to do is basically use the old seawall as a coffer dam, build the new one behind it, and then move the whole seawall back. And so the city and their consultants were sort of touting that they're going to be creating 15 feet, 10 to 15 feet, which is this new setback of this intertidal habitat that's going to be available for juvenile salmon with these habitat improvements. And it dawned on us biologists at some of these meetings where this was put out that, well, that's great, but you're going to have, you're going to shade it. And there were no plans at that juncture for uh, mitigating that shading. We know from much of our work that we've done in the past year and years previous as well, that juvenile salmon, A, in some cases, either won't or hesitate to go into dark areas under piers, or across intense shadow lines, and B, may not be able to biologically function, that is, feed in darkness. And there's really very little data and information out there. So, so the city's solution to this was to have these light panels put into the sidewalk, happy, happy people walking on them. Uh, riparian vegetation here, which, by the way, set back this far is not going to provide much habitat for the salmon. But anyway, this is going to be the scenario. So um, these light panels were kind of added fairly late in the game. Um, and it's been a lesson for me in sort of the interface between um, the really practical application of habitat restoration and all the nuances of, of ha having to have having the issues with construction, having to have a uh, pedestrian passageways and right-of-ways, you know, all the things that are involved with you know, non-scientific stuff with, uh, with the reconstruction of the seawall. Um, so the upshot is the city has a 10-year monitoring plan that they've commissioned by one of their consultants to be put in place after construction to monitor whether or not the light um, yielded by these light passage panels which are really just glass blocks, is enough to um, mitigate the effects of the sidewalk cantilever 10 to 15 feet out over the intertidal habitat. So that's the end. And, and so the major question was, can these engineered microhabitats add to the ecology of the intertidal zone? And I think it's clear from the data that I presented that, yes, the, there was increased tax of richness of both epipenthic and sessil organisms. Um, some increased abundances of these ecologically important species uh, at different junctures along the, the, uh, the timeline of these panels for four years of these um, algae uh, mussels and some of the juvenile salmon prey. But the big caveat is you need to be careful about real world application. And there are still um, 
lessons to be learned and data to be gathered about how these function, how these features function when they're actually put into play. And uh, I think Jason is going to touch on some of that as well because he did look at post um, post deployment function of uh, several kinds of these habitat features. And so that is what I had. Kate, I'm going to ask you if you want to go right on to Jason or if you want to do some questions or whatever. Sure. Um, it looks like there, we, maybe we can ask for a couple questions and then shoot over to, to Jason. So if anybody has any questions, um, please type them into your chat function. And if there's anybody in the room with me that has any questions, um, start with that. Nobody in the room has a question. Um, multiple attendees are asking questions on the chat function. So what I'll do is probably take the first one or two and ask them to you, Jeff, and then I'll save the rest for the end if we have time. Um, so one question from Bart Chesar uh, is, were the structures intertidal? Yes. Um, so the lowest, the bottom of the panels was at about zero foot mean lower low water. And here our tidal range is up to about, uh, from about minus three to about plus 12. And the top of the panels was at about plus six or seven. Okay, and one other question uh, from Shimret Perkol Finkel is, did the design take into account biological considerations? Sounds like it did, but maybe you can address that. Um, yeah, to the degree possible it did. I think, as I mentioned early on, this basically hasn't been tried, but basically we know that adding complexity adds to diversity and, and abundance. So to that degree, yes, but there hasn't been much of this done elsewhere. In fact, it's this particular large-scale panels with different reliefs and microhabitats is really, I think, pretty unique. Has, has anybody tried to get at the response in the salmon population? I, I'd say it seems like it's too small of a scale for the, the panels to actually see any uh, fish use. Is it, did you guys look at that at all, changes in fish You're use of those panels? You're absolutely right. And and so we, we, we did a little bit. We had a... Um, a senior capstone student who did a little bit of video work along the panels, but um, and did fe see, definitely see non salmonid fish use fish like sea perch feeding directly off the panels, opens. But a lot of his work was unfortunately after the owl migration was done. But Jason and I have just completed a, a, an 18 month fish study of the waterfront for the city um, as part of um, required work for. The biological opinion that's being done on it on the seawall rebuild, and what we did we did do is document presence of fish with, around the panels, but not use specifically of the panels. So the answer is no. To, are there plans Sorry? to look at that in the? the are there plans to look at that in the finished product when it when it gets constructed as part of the monitoring plan to look at salmon? Yes, and the 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 ten year monitoring plan includes that, and so it will be much more of a of a landscape level change because they plan on having those habitat features on the entire. It's two thousand linear feet that is going to be replaced. Well, thank you. I think we've got a few other questions, but I'm just going to turn them over to, to Jason now at this point, and, and maybe we'll have some time at the end. But feel free to keep typing questions, and I'll try to keep track. And, and if we can't answer them today, maybe uh, Jason and Jeff will be nice enough to respond over email and I send that to you. So uh, without further ado, let's go to Jason Toft. Okay, my name is Jason Toft, and I'm going to talk about the Olympic Sculpture Park, which was created along the shoreline where the Seattle Art Museum made a sculpture park. Um, so it's a, as Jeff mentioned, it's a completed project. We were fortunate enough to get out before it was constructed, 
and then assess it afterwards. And shown here is a photo of a pocket beach, is what we call it. Um, I'll show some more photos, but it was a riprap. We call this rocky armoring here, riprap out here. I don't know if that's similar to the East Coast or not. Um, but they excavated this beach back behind the riprap, and that is one of the habitat features that they put in. Um, so I'm going to go through my talk, and if there's any aspects I think are repeated from what Jeff said, I'll gleam over them quickly for the sake of time. Um, my outline is basically to give a bit of a background and then focus on the metrics that we monitored at the Sculpture Park, fish, invertebrates, algae, vegetation, um, and then some physical components of how stable and resilient the creatures were. Um, much of this work is in our lab looking at fish netting or snorkel surveys or what the fish are eating, um, looking at the invertebrate populations. And also Andrea Oxton, who's a professor at UW Oceanography, um, she headed up the physical components aspect of the project. And then I'll sum up with some future steps. So Jeff showed the same map. I just wanted to show this again where the Olympic Sculpture Park is here. at the. It's at the north end of the Seattle seawall. Um, and again, this is a lot of, Seattle's built on a lot of fill. You know, the Duwamish River used to have all these nice twists and turns, and it's very homogenized now and linear. Um, so again, a lot of urban development in the area. Um, Chinook salmon are threatened under, under the Endangered Species Act and they migrate and rear along these shorelines. Um, so kind of a framework of how I like to approach these uh, types of restoration. And I have up here how fish assessments can be used to help build restoration projects. Um, you know, fish just being an example. We have come to realize that this can be used in some important ways prior to restoration. You can, they can inform your goals of what you want to accomplish. Um, during project design is the time to incorporate that data and try to make your design the best it can be, biologically speaking at least. And then afterwards and beforehand, if you can get out and monitor it and figure out what works and what doesn't, that can kind of be a feedback loop. Um, there's data strengths and data weaknesses. Data strengths are optimized when there's a focused experimental design and precise data. Um, as Jeff alluded to, there's natural variability out there that is, can be difficult to account for. There's issues of time and space. Mostly you want to make sure you're not comparing apples and oranges. Um, and especially when you're working on, along these very urbanized shorelines, we found that when you take concepts that you would use along a natural shoreline, they may not apply based on how you're going to sample and if you're going to be comparing them to different types of habitat. Um, and down here is just a few photos. There's a juvenile Chinook salmon there. That one's probably about 10 centimeters. Uh, there's issues of forage fish in the area too, uh, smelt and carrying sand lance, and so we're concerned about larval fishes as well in these types of shallow water restoration. And then again, the invertebrates that they feed upon. So I'm going to back up first to a project Jeff mentioned back in 2003, where we went out and we snorkeled and netted along some different shoreline types. Um, this eye here is me snorkeling along a shoreline. There's a cross section of a natural beach here, and then an urbanized armored beach. And you can see that what we found is that fish, juvenile salmon in particular, that were spread out along this big intertidal gradient, when you have that armoring, they're still looking for shallow water. So really, they start to bunch up along that shoreline. We also found that from our diet sampling that whenever you have armoring, whether it goes into intertidal or subtidal waters, or even if it's above the tide line, it's really cutting off that terrestrial component. So we found less insects in juvenile Chinook salmon diets um, if there was any armoring at all. And this was published a few years ago back. The reference is there if you're interested. So to go into the Olympic Sculpture Park, um, when Sam purchased the site and started to think of designs, again, this was riprap here, and then this is the north side of the Seattle seawall right here. So what happened is the pocket beach was excavated from that riprap. And along the seawall, um, it's high tide in this photo, so you can't see it there. There's a habitat bench, which is a low tide terrace that sticks out uh, 15 feet or so from the base of the seawall. And down on the right here is a photo from low tide. Uh, so you can see there's still riprap there, but there's this kind of shelf that sticks out just to mimic some shallow water uh, beach habitat. And then um, a lot of kelp beds grew off the shore of that as well. So um, one other thing I want to mention is that, you know, we use the rest, the term restoration kind of loosely in these scenarios. This isn't, this is not true restoration. 
um, it's attempting to restore some aspects of a natural beach. And we've been referring to this as shoreline enhancement or shoreline rehab re rehabilitation, um, which are terms from the literature as well. And I guess it might be of interest to some people too when, you know, the cost of all this, um, you know, Jeff talked about the Seattle seawall rebuild. So this section was going to have to be rebuilt anyway. And building the habitat bench actually came out to be a cheaper alternative in this case because what they um, figured out is the habitat bench and the riprap coming off of it would stabilize that seawall so that this section would not have to be replaced. So it's actually a cost savings. And this happened a few years before um, the current seawall design. So it is a good example of looking ahead and, and planning for what might happen in the future. Okay, and uh, since the habitat bench is a bit hard to conceptualize, here's a photo. Well, it's taken from an article in the Seattle Times from um, years back, and this is a cross section. So the existing seawall is here. Again, they buttressed it with this riprap here and built this bench out um, to create this habitat bench. And, and it was a good article in the Times that really pinpointed that part of this was to serve as a test case for the future Seattle rebuild and, and how we may be able to biologically improve um, the shoreline. So where are we at here? We, um, we were fortunate to get on 2005. Construction ended in um, 2006, 2007. So we've been out five years, years one three, one, three, and five afterwards to be able to monitor this and see how it's working. Um, it just got accepted parts of this in ecological engineering. Um, so it's good to get this out. You know, it's hard with a lot of applied science um, to make it ap applicable to ecological um, literature out there. So it's good to start to get this out. There's been a lot of work done in Australia, actually, interestingly enough, in Sydney, which um, we work off a lot of their research as well, for examples. So I'm going to give you some kind of photos of what we've been finding and try not to be too graph heavy. So I'll show you some photos of our sampling. I'll go into a couple of graphs on the fish mostly and show some fish videos as well with these slides. Um, so fish, we did snorkel surveys and enclosure netting. Um, that's a photo of some juvenile Chinook swimming. Uh, I'll show some graphs of that in a bit. So we looked at aquatic invertebrates living on bo bottom substrates, which Jeff mentioned as well, these epibenthic invertebrates that we suck up. Um, and again, harpactacoid copepods are very small crustaceans that juvenile chum salmon like to feed on. Amphipods are a little bigger, and polychaete worms, all important prey items. I'm not going to show a graph of this, but we found at the habitat bench in Pocket Beach compared to the adjacent armored shorelines that these harpactacoid crustaceans, again, are more abundant. And overall, there's just more taxa richness at the habitat bench in Pocket Beach. Um, it's not to say that there's nothing along the seawall and riprap armoring. There's a species of amphipod that we found uh, kind of abundant throughout the habitat types. Uh, interestingly enough, we did not find that amphipod in the diet samples from juvenile salmon. So there is still a disconnect there. Um, part of the pocket beach was being able to have this gravel sediment put in. And again, that's just creating habitat that is not there when you have a seawall. So you get um, invertebrates living interstitially in that substrate. Uh, insects we sampled, and a picture here of a chironomid midge fly, and then some aphids. Um, Part of our expectations, I guess, were that when, when you add a lot of these shoreline plantings, you're going to increase insect production. Um, and we found that to happen in some cases, but not others. These, these chironomids are important juvenile salmon prey items. And we did not find any statistical differences there um, between habitat types. So they're kind of ubiquitous along the shoreline. Um, but aphids, if anyone uh, is into gardening, you may already be able to guess this. Um, Aphids are very vegetation oriented and other conifers. So we found an increase in aphids along the planted shorelines, which is good because, um, again, that's the type of insect that juvenile salmon like to prey upon. Uh, aquatic algae, uh, there's been a lot of algae growth off the shore along the pocket beach and habitat bench. A lot of kelp has grown there. Uh, and that's great because that just came all in naturally. There's just good hold fast and some good shallow water area there and a good tidal gradient. Um, and then I'll talk a bit in a few slides as well about vegetation and beach structure. This is um, 
we called it the vegetation swath. It's above the habitat bench, and this is the seawall here. So what, um, you know, how is that vegetation growing? This is, there's a lot of visitors down here, as you might expect, being a sculpture park and a major park right in downtown Seattle. Um, so how stable and resilient those features are. Okay, so I'm just going to show a couple of fish graphs here just to show you what's going on. Um, this is juvenile salmon densities through time. The y-axis is just uh, numbers of fish we, we're seeing in our snorkel surveys. And this was back in 2005 before the shoreline enhancements took place. Um, so kind of a baseline of what's going on. You can see that from April through July, we have a lot of juvenile salmon out-migrating out along these shorelines. The green is chum. So they're smaller in size and out-migrate a bit earlier. The blues are mostly Chinook. We have a bit of a tough time um, separating Chinook and Coho uh, when you're observing doing snorkel surveys. Um, but there's kind of a few things going on. In April, we know these are wild Chinook fry, so they're smaller Chinook, and we know they're wild just because um, a few sampling techniques plus most hatcheries don't release until May. Um, so, I mean, both the main take-home point is like, oh, wow, look at this. Okay, it's an urban shoreline. We still have really three or four months of juvenile salmon use along these shorelines. So what happened when we first went out in 2007? Um, again, these are fish densities, and the first two columns are riprap, shallow and deep, and then the pocket beach habitat bench. You can see that there's larger numbers along the pocket beach shallow and the habitat bench shallow transects. So again, a lot of these fish seem to be looking for that shallow water areas, and these were statistically higher than along the riprap shallow. Um, again, natural variability exists. We did not find this uh, to be the case in 2009 and found some similar trends in, in 2011. Um, what we did find in 2009 was a lot of larval fish. So we had never seen a lot of these schools of larval fish along the shoreline here. Um, our category of, of larval fish is just fish that are really too small to identify when you're doing snorkel surveys, so um, under two centimeters or so. Uh, a lot of these, from the ones we could get a few net samples and identify, about 85% of these were forage fish, those uh, surf smelt and other fish species that um, people care about and are important to try to restore shallow water habitat for as well. So we've seen a lot of larval fish along the pocket beach and habitat bench. Um, so my next two slides, I'm pretty sure, are videos. And just to give you a heads up, because they can move kind of quick, hopefully they play well over the webinar. The first is going to be juvenile Chinook salmon feeding and schooling along the shoreline, just so you get a sense of what the fish are doing out there. So these are juvenile Chinook salmon smolts, um, probably about 8 or 9 centimeters. You can see them darting to the surface to feed. So we found good observations of foraging behavior along these shorelines. And uh, most measurements of that, we have found increased feeding behavior along the habitat bench and pocket beach. Uh, the next slide is going to be juvenile chum salmon. These, again, are usually smaller fish when they're out migrating and a little closer to the surface of the water. And again, we're seeing um, good foraging behaviors along these shorelines. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking for with the salmon. You know, they have to transition when they hit the estuary from freshwater to saltwater, um, and they need to feed and grow along these shorelines in order to make it out to the ocean and head back. Okay, so I think that's it for graphs. Um, I'm going to kind of head towards the summary here by just showing some photos to give you a more complete picture of what happened with the vegetation and with the uh, beach sediments. So again, in the foreground is the riprap armoring. In the background is the seawall. This was in um, 2005 before restoration. And you can see, too, a lot of you know pavement and lawn in the uplands here. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit of a timeline of the vegetation plantings at the pocket beach. Um, to your right is the end of the pocket beach. There's driftwood here and some paths going through. And this is all planted shoreline vegetation with some dune grass here along the edges as well. Uh, this is 2007, 2009, and 2011. So um, the vegetation, for the most part, has remained stable and grown. Um, it is a major park, so there are some issues of paths and a bit of trampling. We found that the driftwood here 
really anchors in some of these areas. Um, this is a section of dune grass here where, you know, you can see where people have basically sat on the logs and there's a bit of trampling, but where the logs are protecting the dune grass a bit, uh, there's been really good growth. So it's kind of a happy medium of human use and, um, you know, vegetation coexisting in the same area. Um, beach sediments, so, you know, this is not, this is not a natural beach, and the beaches along Preacher Sound are mostly um, nourished by bluffs. There's a lot of bluff erosion, which causes sediment accumulation along beaches. That is cut off in this area. And for the most part, uh, the sediments have remained stable. I'm just going to show you an example or two of what we are keeping eyes on. Um, this photo here is from uh, El Nino High Tide in January 2010, I think it was where we just had, I think the tides were two feet or so higher than predicted. Um, so you can see in this case, the water washed a lot of sediments up onto the beach. And there's not a natural mechanism really to replace those sediments. Um, although lucky for us, there are human mechanisms for that. Kids love throwing rocks. So uh, there's kind of this interesting anthropogenic <laughs> factors going on of, you know, children enjoying themselves throwing rocks around. There's some high storm tides coming up, moving sediment around. Um, here's a cross section of An Andrea Oxton's uh, surveys, just showing that um, the physical profiles of the beach have remained fairly stable, although there's a lot of frequent motion here in the upper tide levels. And there's been just a bit of riprap, not failure, but kind of, you know, the riprap buttressing the beach on either side has kind of settled a little bit over the years. Okay, so to sum up, this is a conceptual model from our report that we have up. Um, kind of detailed, too detailed to go into here, but just to let you know it exists, it kind of details a lot of the pros and cons of what we've seen here with the habitat bench and pocket beach. Um, and to kind of summarize up, what we're finding is that these five bullets here, uh, this is a good nursery area for fish. They are having foraging opportunities there. Um, there's good riparian value of shoreline plantings um, and insect production going on in certain cases. And increasing that shallow water area along with plantings really just increases that aquatic terrestrial connectivity in a very urbanized area. And, um, and again, physical resilience, it's, it's doing well so far and we hope it will keep doing well, but probably something to keep an eye on that may have to be maintained along these really urbanized shorelines. Um, so this is my concluding slide, just giving a few bullets on monitoring and restoration. Um, it can give you valuable information on the status of the site. Again, this can be a big of, bit of a feedback loop that can help design future design features, such as the Seattle seawall rebuild. Um, so important to think about that, even in areas where you think, oh, we can't restore this area. Um, we're finding that you can improve it from whatever the armor conditions are. And a lot of what we're trying to keep in mind is 10 years from now or so, what information are you going to wish you had collected? This is kind of emerging science along Seattle shorelines, at least, and it's um, interesting to see it being used a lot by management as well. And with that, I will uh, sum up. And I guess, Kate, if there's more questions for both me and Jeff, we can field that. Thank you, Jason. I think we have time for just a couple questions because we're nearing the hour here. Um, I'll ask again if anybody in the room has a question. <coughs> if, if not, I'm going to ask you a question that I think we asked you before, but um, have you had, when you're trying to do stuff that expands out from the seawall, have you had conversations with the regulatory community about habitat exchange and sort of how you've entered that conversation? Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and um, and really I haven't entered that conversation a whole lot, but I do know the goings-on um, since we don't specifically work in permitting and regulation. But uh, the Sculpture Park got around that fill issue really by having the pocket beach be a bit of mitigation. So by excavating the pocket beach inland, um, that kind of allowed to have the habitat bench be fill out from the seawall. And again, that also went along with buttressing that seawall so that it would not have to be replaced. Um, I know that is a huge issue, though, you know, with putting fill out into the aquatic realm, even when it's such 
an urbanized area. Yeah, there's a, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice. I'm still getting over a cold, but uh, there's a, uh, there's going to be probably a larger beach put in as part of the seawall rebuild that's going to entail a lot more fill near the ferry dock at the south end of the downtown area that it will be it, it will be both an exercise in biology but also an exercise in in permitting and and regulatory buy-off because there it's controversial in <clears throat> in some ways great it looks like we have one one more person typing a question so i think we'll we'll probably take that question and then um then sign off um, Marcia Johnson wants to ask um, whether or not you've explored tidal pools. Is that part of? Yeah, I can uh, I can answer both the intertidal vegetation and tidal pools kind of at once. <clears throat> um, the concept of tide pools has has come up numerous times, uh, and there are some. There's a couple of issues with. It. First is just there's not very much intertidal real estate in this particular context for tidal pools um, because uh, there's just not that much horizontal habitat. It's it's mostly seawall habitat and then goes down to fairly low intertidal in a lot of cases. And B is just the engineering aspect. It, tidal pools would have to be fairly heavily engineered and made out of <clears throat> fairly... Um, hard, massive substrata in order to have them persist. And there's been a lot of controversy about just that much stuff being put out there. And then finally, there's also been some discussion about, well, do you really want to encourage people to come down and play in tidal pools when you have uh, you know, juvenile salmon out migrating? And that really should be your emphasis, not, not humans, but we all realize that there needs to be a mix of both. So, so those are the issues that have been discussed vis-a-vis -vis tidal pools. And on the vegetation, yes, there are there are is a quite a diverse um, uh, community of algal vegetation. But in this type of habitat, no vascular vegetation. There's no intertidal uh, steelgrass or seagrasses. That kind of thing in these kind of habitats, it's too uh, the substrate's too coarse, and most of it's too low in the intertidal within the bay itself. But algae, yes, a lot of different species going all the way up to about plus six or seven feet for the rockweed. And one final question, then I'll ask everyone to uh, maybe send any questions to me, and I can relay them to Jeff and, and Jason. My email is habitat at harboressuary.org. And uh, the last question is from Shimrit Perkolfinkel, and she's asking you if, if you feel engineers will be open to these designs. Are they kind of receptive? Are they, um, are they untested? Are there concerns? Yeah, I think, it, I think they, they already have been. And in fact, um, Seattle Department of the Transportation engineers were an integral part of the development. The first project leader on this for the city, who's moved on to bridges now, uh, was was an engineer, and so at least in that context, they've been very supportive. And <clears throat> um, outside of, I don't have any experience outside of the Seattle experience, but it, it 